March 6, 1957, the Gold Coast became the first black African colony to gain independence from colonial Britain. Renamed Ghana, this newly independent nation would be led by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah was celebrated as a hero, a visionary who would show Africa the way to independence. And while Ghana led the way, other African nations would soon follow. Between 1958 and 1964, 26 African nations gained their freedom from colonial rule. It was the end of an era. A new generation of African nationalists had come to power. Men like Nkrumah in Ghana, Ahmed Sekouture in Guinea, and Patrice Lumumba in what was then the Belgian Congo. For Africa, it was a period of great optimism. There is a new African in the world, ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. And Krumah called for a United States of Africa, where all African nations would be members of a political union, much like the United States. He dreamed of a day when all of Africa would be united under a single flag with a star for each country. As the flag of newly independent Ghana rose for the first time in the night sky, it was clear that Nkrumah hoped the stars would be black. Funding for this program was provided by the Australian Film Finance Corporation, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Screen West, and the Lotteries Commission of Western Australia. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Nkrumah's hopes for colonial independence had begun during World War II. United States President Franklin Roosevelt had secured from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill a promise that all nations of the world would be allowed to chart their own political course. Churchill didn't realize it at the time, but it was the beginning of the end for European colonialism. A new power was on the world scene, the United States of America. And it faced a world which had already been containerized by the European powers. And it said, open up, unlock, we want in. And that unlocking was independence from the American point of view. As World War II drew to a close, the United Nations was formed. It would provide a forum where nations could meet to address issues of mutual concern. Among the founding principles of this new organization was a declaration of support for political freedom and independence. The colonial powers of Europe vastly underestimated the power this would have. When I first joined the UN in 1945, I was astonished, at, particularly the British Foreign Office, and people would say, well, decolonization is a small matter, you know, 100 years, 150 years, maybe. Well, actually, it took 20. Colonialism, of course, is the absolute enemy of uh, open economies and of free trade. Colonialism is about anything. It's about managing economies, and restricting access, either formally or informally. And it emphasizes the importance of Africa as a producer of raw materials. Known to Europeans and Americans for centuries as the Dark Continent, Africa represented a place of exotic animals, strange people and customs, and sometimes unimaginable wealth. The continent existed as much in the imagination as it did in reality. By the late 1880s, European nations had colonized virtually all of Africa. 
1884, they met in Berlin to draw up the political boundaries of their colonies. These boundaries seldom had much to do with the realities of Africa. This, of course, meant that in some instances they split peoples. In other instances, it meant that people who had been fighting each other before the map was drawn were now put into one administrative unit. Um, of course, the Europeans could all play on that in order to keep the peace. During the Second World War, the Europeans had recruited their colonial subjects to the war effort. African conscripts were not always well treated. In 1948, in the Gold Coast's capital, Accra, disgruntled ex-soldiers demonstrated for fair pay for their wartime service. A number were shot and killed by colonial police, sparking riots across the country. One of those imprisoned without trial in the aftermath of the rioting was Kwame Nkrumah. He had just returned from England to be General Secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention Party. Nkrumah's arrest instantly transformed him into a national hero. The Gold Coast was one of the richest colonies in Africa. Diamonds, gold, and cocoa were its main exports. Its early history was dominated by the slave trade. Nkrumah himself came from a small village near the old slaving forts of Elmina. In the 1930s, he managed to make his way to the United States to study. While in the U.S., he was influenced by African-American scholars and black nationalist pioneers. At about the same time as Nkrumah was gaining prominence in the Gold Coast, Ahmed Sekouture was emerging as the leader in the French colony of Guinea, also in West Africa. Ahmed Sekouture, c'est Dieu qui l'a donné à la Guinée. Et Ahmed Sekouture a commencé la lutte d'indépendance, d'émancipation du peuple d'Afrique, du peuple de Guinée, très tôt. Il a d'abord choisi la section syndicale pour s'élever contre l'injustice coloniale. A mineral-rich territory of five million people, Guinea had been a French possession since 1891. Like the Gold Coast, it had a history of slavery, and it was still being tolerated by the French. N'oubliez pas que la Guinée. Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on ignore généralement. Quand Sécoutouré arrive au pouvoir en 1957, elle a encore un quart de sa population composée d'esclaves. A fiery union leader, Sécoutouré built a huge personal following by championing the cause of the downtrodden, including women. Nous, femmes, nous étions des esclaves du colonialisme et nos maris, nos fils et nos époux qui étaient là étaient en même temps les esclaves. Et comme la tradition africaine voudrait que la femme se soumette à l'homme, nous, esclaves déjà, nous étions encore esclaves de l'esclave. <laughs> Ça veut dire que c'était ardu. Donc l'arrivée d'un rassembleur de masse comme le président Mercedes-Benz était la bienvenue. Donc très tôt, elles l'ont suivi. Elles ont milité dans les syndicats, elles ont milité au sein du parti. But just as African nationalists were gaining power, another global conflict was developing that would have a huge influence on their destinies. You know, the Cold War was inevitable. There was a vacuum of power left after the Second World War. Uh, the, the Axis states were exhausted and defeated. The colonial world was in anti-colonial tumult, and the only two countries capable of filling that vacuum were Soviet Union and the United States. The uh, significance of the, the Cold War to Africa is something that plays out throughout the 1940s and 1950s. There are all sorts of spins on this. One of them is the attempt by colonial powers to uh, 
maintain the, the importance of colonialism in terms of world, world opinion by arguing that colonialism was the enemy of communism, that without colonialism, without the moderation, as they claimed it, of colonialism, what would break out would be, in effect, the Soviet colonization of the hearts and minds and perhaps even the territory of places like tropical Africa. And this was a, a, a myth. But it soon became clear that despite the Cold War, America would not automatically back the colonial powers in Africa. In 1956, Egyptian President Abdul Nasser nationalized the strategically valuable Suez Canal. Britain and France invaded to take it back. The United States bitterly opposed the campaign, as did the United Nations. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. President Eisenhower finally threatened to cut off British oil supplies. In the face of this threat, the British were forced to abandon the operation. United Nations peacekeeping forces arrived, and the British and French evacuated. Suez is critical. OK. Uh, uh, the old colonialism, uh, with its notion that a political monopoly, no open market, nothing, uh, it's, it's, it's finished. Um, and, and Suez convinces the British, the French, that the Americans mean business. In the Gold Coast, Nkrumah had formed his own political party and won a massive majority in 1956 elections. This resulted in getting the British to agree to grant independence in March of the following year. The United States' interest in Africa was at a peak, and a number of prominent Americans attended the independent celebrations. These included then Vice President Richard Nixon and Dr. Martin Luther King. Nkrumah took advantage of the moment to call for freedom throughout Africa. Our independence is meaningless, so let it let up the total repression of the African continent. <laughs> At independence, everybody was excited. It was unbelievable. Uh, everyone expected great things to happen. We're going to rule ourselves. Uh, decide on our own program for education, for health, the social services, improve agriculture, and industrialize our economy. So it, it was, uh, the sky was a limit. Following independence, Ghana became a magnet for nationalist leaders from all over Africa. And Krumah hosted a series of conferences aimed at building support for a united Africa. That brought in Almost all the freedom fighters uh, uh, from Africa, South Africa, Rhodesia, East Africa, North Africa. This uh, first group of leaders, they were attending the African uh, Freedom Fighters conferences. I appeal to you in the sacred name of Mother Africa to leave this conference resolved to rededicate yourselves to the speedy liberation of your territories. Attending the conferences were Ahmed Sekouture of Guinea and a militant young nationalist named Patrice Lumumba from the Belgian Congo. Je crois que les rencontres avec um, Nkrumah, Sekouture et les autres, c'était un tournant décisif dans le combat, disons, de, de, de Patrice, disons, de Lumumba, que qu'il a senti que nous ne sommes pas seuls dans notre lutte. Forward then to independence to independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa. Nkrumah had, had always been a Pan-Africanist. From 1957, he 
for a short period becomes without doubt the leader of, uh, of Africa. He is the first most successful, most skillful, best known. He's on uh, the cover of Time magazine. Uh, he's the toast of the town. This is one of the most famous men in the world. But this is a man, a colossus, uh, intellectually, uh, politically. And he makes Accra for a short period into the hub of African reaction to the colonial world, trying to bring together uh, African politicians with an eventual view to creating a United Nations of Africa. That, that's the, the, the eventual ambition. By the late 1950s, the French had undergone a major change in their African policy. A bloody civil war in their North African colony of Algeria in 1958 had led to the recall of World War II hero Charles de Gaulle. Soon after taking power, de Gaulle drafted a radical new French constitution. Among other things, it proposed independence for France's African colonies, but structured this in such a way that the former colonies would remain militarily, politically, and economically tied to France. France's African colonies would be allowed to vote in a referendum. A yes vote was an endorsement for de Gaulle's plan, independence but with close ties to France. A no vote was a vote for complete political and economic independence. It's that the government of de Gaulle has prepared this referendum to justify aux yeux de l'opinion internationale, la légalité, la légitimité du régime français sur les territoires occupés. In August of 1958, de Gaulle toured the African colonies to promote the yes vote. On the 25th of August, he arrived at Conakry, capital of French Guinea. De Gaulle made his way through cheering crowds to the Territorial Assembly. Here, Secouture rose to bluntly address the French president. Et Ahmed Secouture a pris la parole pour dire au général De Gaulle que nous préférons la liberté dans la pauvreté à l'opulence dans l'esclavage. C'est ce jour-là qu'il l'a prononcé. Et le général de Gaulle et son entourage ont estimé que cela, c'est un affront. On September 28, the African citizens of French colonies voted. All voted yes, except in Guinea, where an astounding 95% voted no. Only if a uh, secretary in Guinea votes not and is punished very severely by the French uh, for doing that. I mean, all aid, all school teachers, there are stories of taps being ripped out of walls and so on by the departing French, which throws secretary very much onto the, the mercy of the Soviet Union at that particular juncture. Nous ont forcé à être uh, socialistes. Ils ont retiré tout leur matériel. Ils ont retiré tout. Eh bien, on va, est-ce qu'on va, comment dire, crever de faim, de soif, de machin, on ne peut pas s'habiller Eh bien, c'est pour cela. Les gens ont tendu la main. Est-ce que l'esclave peut être euh, idiot pour revenir encore Non, 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 je ne veux pas, je veux rester esclave. Non, nous avons dit non, non et non. The French reaction left Secouture and Guinea in financial crisis. Secouture flew to Ghana to consult with Nkrumah. In a gesture of solidarity, Nkrumah agreed to give Secouture 10 million British pounds, an enormous sum at the time. Both of them was believed in socialism as the way forward for African countries. Both of them were nationalistic in perception. Both of them were ardent supporters of African unity. 
what was to become a lifetime friendship was cemented with a dramatic agreement to work towards a full union of the two countries. As events were unfolding in the British and French colonies, the Belgians became alarmed. Hoping to avoid political embarrassment or violent confrontation, the Belgians announced in 1959 that their colony, the Congo, would be granted independence the following year. The Congo was a vast territory spanning the equatorial jungles of Central Africa. The Belgians who had believed that they would be in the Congo forever, suddenly realized that with the French colonies all going all around them and the British about to go, Rhodesia, for example, they were going to be left with an impossible situation. So they suddenly granted independence of the Congo with no preparation at all. The movement for independence under black leadership in West and Central Africa did not go unnoticed in other parts of the continent, particularly in places like Rhodesia and South Africa, which had large populations of white settlers. I think there are very few South Africans who were not aware of the fact that Ghana had been liberated, that the French terrorists had been liberated, and that sooner or later they were going to have to deal with that problem. South Africa's racist apartheid policies had set the country against the times. Its parliament was in the historic city of Cape Town, near the southernmost tip of the continent. On the 3rd of February, 1960, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan arrived at the South African parliament to deliver a landmark speech. He was accompanied by South African leader, Henrik Verwoerd. The, the atmosphere was quite tense to start with. His speech was very nuanced, and, and uh, uh, if you read it carefully and listen carefully, there's no mistaking what he was saying, that the game is up, uh, my friends. <laughs> uh, white supremacy is doomed. Our judgment of right and wrong and of justice is rooted in the same soil as yours. In Christianity and in the rule of law as the basis of a free society. Macmillan told the shocked South Africans that there was a wind of change sweeping the continent. African nationalism would have to be accommodated. I remember, Favot was a very impassive person. He could sit through and he would never show any emotion. But I could sense, from my point of view, I was said, hell, he must be boiling inside. The immediate reaction was that Britain is taking the side of the blacks against the Afrikaans. Now, that was not a new thing, but this was the official position taken by the British. And that, of course, was a sort of subtle declaration of war. The international press would later dub 1960 the Year of Africa. The French and Belgian colonies would be independent within two years, and Britain's within seven. Only the Portuguese held on until the 1970s. In the Congo, the Belgians had done little to prepare their colony for independence. Only three top civil servants were Africans. There were no black army officers and few university graduates. Because Lumumba believed that real power would reside with the prime minister, he accepted that position allowing a man named Joseph Kasavubu to become president. The two were from different ethnic backgrounds, and they had very different personalities. Kasavubu was relatively placid. Lumumba was passionate, fiery, and outspoken. At the end of June, the two welcomed the king of the Belgians, who had arrived in Leopoldville to celebrate the Congo's independence. Peuple 
et émotion que le Congo accède ce 30 juin 1960 plein accord et amitié avec la Belgique à l'indépendance et à la souveraineté internationale. Following the King's speech, Lumumba made a speech of his own. Nous avons connu que la loi n'était jamais la même que lorsqu'il s'agissait d'un blanc ou d'un noir. Accommodable pour les uns, prière lui-même pour les autres. Et Patrice fait son fameux discours. Pff, évidemment, c'est inattendu, c'est dur. Il attaque les coloniaux qui ont fait souffrir les nègres pendant longtemps. Nous qui avons souffert dans notre corps et dans notre état de l'oppression colonialiste, nous vous le disons, tout cela est désormais fini. Tous les Afro-Asiatiques dans la salle applaudissent. Les coloniaux, évidemment, et le roi des Belges. C'est la stupeur. Ceux qui ont le monde sont pas habitués à entendre such talk d'un a, a, a black man ou de quelqu'un. Et sa speech à la Independence Day ceremony a uh, mis le premier nail dans son coffin. The Belgians had expected that whites would remain to train Africans to take over. Within a week, these hopes were dashed. In one week, the country was completely a shambles because the army mutinied, threw out their white officers, and then went after the married quarters. And that started a panic which spread to the civilian Belgian administration. So in about 10 days, the entire Belgian administration had gone. So you were left, it was like the Mary Celeste, here was a huge country, the size of the whole of Western Europe, with a very complicated kind of infrastructure, completely without anyone at the switch. I mean, it was amazing. The Belgians believed that the Congolais, after the independence, they will start to take the children, the women, the women to eat. And there was this sudden rush of people leaving like lemmings. There was actually quite a lot of violence and people being killed. So it was, it was a great period of uncertainty and it was quite scary. And so, yes, people were sort of just um, dropping things and just leaving. On the 9th of July, Belgium responded by sending in paratroops. In particular, they wanted to protect the mineral-rich province of Katanga. Two days later, with Belgian backing, the province seceded under the leadership of Moïse Chambé. Chambé was run by the, these huge mining uh, combines, and they were able to put him forward as this wonderfully civilized, sort of uh, Western values kind of chap, uh, who was the exact opposite of Patrice Lumumba, this horrible communist uh, rabble riser. Well, both images were completely wrong. I mean, poor Trombe, he, was a, he, he wasn't a particularly Western values guy. He was prepared to chop anybody's head off, too. Uh, and Lumumba wasn't a communist stooge. He was a loose cannon opportunist. Confronted with a rapidly deteriorating situation and horrified at the Katangan threat to his vision of a free and united Congo, Lumumba looked to the outside world for help. When the Belgians sent the paratroops back in to get the rest of the Belgians out. Lumumba appealed to President Eisenhower to send the United States Marines. Eisenhower dodged that one and said, well, the place you need to go is up, you go to the, go to the UN. Rejected by the Americans, Lumumba found a supporter in UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, who in an amazing feat of diplomacy and logistics, managed to put together a UN peacekeeping force in just five days. We had no time to prepare for this at all. I thought that the Congo was on the Indian Ocean, I have to admit. I mean, I hadn't even had time to look it up on the map. I just had to pack and go. Bolstered by the arrival of UN forces, Lumumba visited his increasingly socialist mentor in Ghana. During that short visit of Lumumba, they signed a union treaty, a very short treaty which made, uh, which established a union 
between uh, Ghana and Congo as a beginning of a united uh, states of Africa. Lumumba now began accepting Soviet supplies, including aircraft. America became increasingly concerned. The United States deplores the unilateral action of the Soviet Union in supplying aircraft and other equipment for military purposes to the Congo. The Cold War took overtook all principles. You could do anything. I mean, I thought it was, uh, you know, it was so much of it was on both sides was to do with paranoia and misreporting. I mean, the idea that Patrice Lumumba was a Soviet agent is nonsense. He wasn't. He would have, he would have taken airplanes and help from anybody. It was thought that if, if somebody could, could uh, hold this country, the center of Africa, he would dominate the whole continent. And there was a terrible fear on the part of the United States, the CIA and so forth, uh, that the Soviet Union would manage to do that. Vive le Congo indépendant. Vive le Congo uni. When Patrice Lumumba became the head of state, he was increasingly under the influence of the, uh, the Russians and also of other communist bloc countries. And therefore, it was a very dangerous situation. And I was reputed to be a person who could deal and would enjoy dealing in a situation like that. This, this was a... Uh, a man, um, Lumumba, who had just a few years earlier had been a, as he's described, a barefoot postal worker. And now all of a sudden he was called by an aide to President uh, Eisenhower. He was called a threat to world security and peace. Lumumba decided it was time to invade and recapture Katanga. Lumumba launched the Congolese army, no officers or anything, in Soviet aircraft on what was supposed to be an invasion of Katanga, and they all landed in the Diamond province, which was then called Kathai. And since they didn't have logistics, <laughs> they, they simply looted everything, and they massacred the, the main tribe in Kathai, with the Baluba, who were the most in, sort of advanced people in the Congo. On the 5th of September, Congo's President Kasavubu decided that Lumumba was out of control and had to be stopped. What followed bordered on the farcical. He went to the radio station and dismissed Lumumba. And Lumumba went to the same radio station 10 minutes later and dismissed, dismissed Kasavubu. And the United States backed Kasavubu, the Soviet Union backed Lumumba, and we were off to the races. I mean, this was impossible. On the 14th of September, with Kasavubu and Lumumba locked in a political stalemate, events took another dramatic turn. Army Chief of Staff Joseph Mobutu staged a coup. Mobutu was a very plausible guy. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him, actually. In fact, he declared his first coup d'etat from my bedroom, much to my annoyance. Saying, he came in saying he was very tired and nervous, so we gave him a bottle of whiskey and a radio. And I came back to check on him, and suddenly over the radio came his voice declaring he'd taken the country over. And I said, he said, c'est moi, c'est moi. And I said, out, Hugo, that's it. <laughs> out. <laughs> you don't, you simply don't. I think I may even say it's not cricket to declare coup d'etat over the radio from somebody's bedroom. You can't do that. Working with Mobutu, who was prone to work with, with us, meant that, um, that uh, we, we had some ability to, to do something about the situation which we viewed as getting increasingly worse. And Mobutu was then not at all well liked by the Russians. Consequently, the Russians were continually proving to us that Mobutu was reliable. For the next five years, Mobutu would use American backing and his position as army chief to control the Congo's politicians. Following his coup, he expelled all Soviet personnel and placed Lumumba under house arrest. At the United Nations, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev was furious. The Russians were convinced that Americans had orchestrated the whole affair. Khrushchev was furious about what was happening in the Congo. 
Here, the Soviet Union's looking at the Congo as becoming a new satellite of the Soviet Union, right in the heart of Africa, a prize Cold War pawn, or maybe even a rook, if you like. But by the time that the UN gets involved, they drive the Soviets out. And Khrushchev, in the United Nations, denounces the organization and says basically it's just a puppet of the United States because behind the UN comes the United States and the CIA and this determination to win over the Congo for the American way, for the American cause, for democracy. During the same week that the Congo debate was raging at the UN, the organization admitted 16 new African nations. 13 of them former French colonies. Les nouveaux pays vont devenir euh, une clientèle au fond de la France à l'organisation des Nations Unies. Or euh, ceci est important parce que euh, les pays d'Afrique représentent à, à, dans les années 1960 plus du quart des sièges à l'ONU. The newly independent African nations would not be as friendly to the United States as the US had hoped. Instead of having this grateful new group of nations strongly anti-Soviet in the UN, you've got this, these sort of adolescent governments jumping up and down, criticizing everything uh, that was, that was um, sacred to the United States. In the Congo itself, the UN began protecting Lumumba, fearing that his life was in danger. In evidence later uncovered by a US Senate investigation led by Senator Frank Church, it appeared the Eisenhower administration was involved in attempts to assassinate Lumumba. When I read the church report on assassinating foreign leaders some 15 years later, I discovered that the two CIA assassins, one was a sharpshooter and one was a poisoner. The chief scientist of the CIA went to the Congo carrying about what has been called a, a lethal biological material which was actually a virus of some sort. Uh, he was unable to arrange for someone in the confidence of Lumumba to get close enough to him to uh, inflict this virus upon him. Um, so then the US began plotting with other people in the Congo who were against Lumumba to kill him in more uh, traditional ways. It was said that there were plans to assassinate Lumumba. That, to my mind, is incredibly wrong, because we, by then, had laws against assassination. We cannot do that. Second, uh, there's no need to do that. That was going to be taken care of elsewhere. On November 27th, Lumumba made a fateful decision to leave the protection of the UN to try to reach Stanleyville, which at the time was controlled by his supporters. Lumumba by this time was in, in hiding and on the, on the run, and uh, the CIA was in close contact with all the people who were after him. They, they took part in arranging roadblocks to cut off Lumumba in his flight. On the 1st of December, after five days on the run, Lumumba and two colleagues were captured by Mobuto's troops. Oblivious to world sensitivities, Mobuto allowed Lumumba to be manhandled and paraded in front of the cameras. John F. Kennedy had by this time been elected president of the United States. He'd been chairman of a Senate committee on Africa and was a strong supporter of African independence. So that much of the world was looking forward to this new, fresh Africa policy, and particularly at home, African Americans were looking forward to it. On the 17th of January, 1961, just three days before Kennedy's inauguration, Mobuto delivered Lumumba to his Katangan secessionist enemies. 
Jack Dixon was first officer on the plane that flew Lumumba and his two colleagues to Katanga's capital, Elizabethville. He went to the back there to meet Lumumba, and he was being literally, physically abused beyond belief. Uh, Dad actually asked the, you know, the, uh, the soldiers there, you know, just to cut it out, and uh, these guys just turned around and just told him, you know, you go and fly your aeroplane, and uh, this is our business. And uh, Dad, well, you know, he got the message very clearly. And they landed. And Dad vividly um, uh, recounts the story that he was um, underneath the DC-4, and the, you know, the doors of that DC-4, they sit about um, you know, a good three-odd metres uh, high. And there was Lumumba with his... Um, he was like that, the way Dad recounts it, with his um, strung up like that, tossed off the back of a DC-4. Despite disturbing rumours, for nearly four weeks, Lumumba's fate was unclear. Finally, on the 13th of February, it was announced that he had been murdered. The exact details remain shrouded in controversy. Few believe the Katangan version of events, that Lumumba had been shot while trying to escape. Gradually, it was established that Lumumba had been executed shortly after landing at Elizabethville. His body had apparently been completely destroyed, either by burning or being dissolved in acid. On a fusillé, mais après l'avoir torturé abominablement tout au long d'ailleurs de son voyage en avion. Et on sait aujourd'hui que la, la décision de le mettre à mort a été prise par le gouvernement du, au complet du Katanga, ivre mort. Et ils ont assisté tous à l'exécution en prenant comme prétexte un mensonge qui a été, qui a été prouvé. Euh, on a fait croire que les prisonniers avaient essayé, tenté de s'évader, ce qui est tout à fait faux. Je crois tout à fait avec la complicité de mon pays, avec des officiers belges présents au moment de l'assassinat qui donnent les ordres de tirer. Il avait des artères internes et des acteurs, disons, externes. Des acteurs internes, c'est-à-dire le milieu de Mobutu, de Kassavubu et de Chombe, et etc. Et de l'autre côté, à l'extérieur, il y avait le milieu occidental, à l'occurrence belge, et, et la CIA. C'est la raison pour laquelle la CIA américaine a dit « Ah, ben, puisque les Belges s'en occupent maintenant, on n'a plus besoin d'envoyer ». Non, sans poisonneur, pour le tuer par le poison. Only 35 years old, Lumumba had been killed a mere 200 days after the Congo had achieved independence. Widespread outrage erupted across the world and even into the chamber of the UN Security Council itself. The Congo was now split into three major factions. Kasavubu's new government in Leopoldville, backed by Mobutu and the United States, Lumumbus rebels in Stanleyville, backed by the Soviet Union, and Chombe secessionists in Katanga, backed by the Belgians. As fighting flared across the country, cash-rich Katanga hired white mercenary soldiers from South Africa and Europe. The Americans responded by using Cuban exiles to pilot Mobuto's planes. Kennedy felt increasingly caught in the contradictions. And one of the, the, the crisis flashpoints in Africa for Kennedy was the Congo. Suddenly, we're criticizing Belgium. And these are NATO allies. They're saying, quit criticizing what we're doing there. We're not criticizing what's happening in Alabama, where, where you're not giving African Americans the right to vote and that people are being killed in haze. Why are you bothering with our colonial problem? And so Kennedy found himself in a real flap. By the end of the Kennedy years, he in many ways sold Africa downriver. On the 13th of September, 1961, 
the United Nations finally took sides, attempting to end the Katanga secession. The campaign was a fiasco. Within days, UN troops would be surrounded or captured. The disaster was compounded by the death of Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld in a mysterious plane crash at Elizabethville. For expatriates still in the Congo, things went from bad to worse. There was a lot of killing and torturing, um, rape and um, stalking and people having to run into plantations and being chased after and the noise is the drumming and the soldiers were smoking uh, shava which is like cannabis it was all pretty out of whack and chaotic and um, really scary as the congo descended into bloody chaos and krumah's dream of a united africa also seemed to be falling apart I think Nkrumah was actually very typical of what happened to many, many African countries. After all, he was the father of independence. He'd done a great job. He was actually a very engaging person. And once he got to power, he became de very deluded. I mean, he became a megalomaniac on pan-Africanism, which he was going to lead. Uh, he became extremely paranoid about his neighbors. Uh, he became very dictatorial. All sorts of splits appear in the, the basic agenda of pan-Africanism, partly based on language, uh, that basically English-speaking African politicians didn't speak French, and French-speaking African politicians mm. didn't speak English. Uh, their understanding of what a good breakfast was was different. These cultural things actually mattered quite a lot. And there are these serious political differences. In May 1963, in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa, Nkrumah's vision for Africa was effectively ended by the creation of the Organization of African Unity. It was a representative body more like the United Nations than the nation-state model that Nkrumah had wanted. In the Congo, the Katanga secession was finally defeated. Chambe temporarily fled to Europe. On June 30th, 1964, Exactly four years to the day after the Congo had achieved independence, UN troops finally withdrew. In a final bizarre twist, Tambe then returned to the Congo to serve as prime minister of Kasavubu's Mobutu-backed government. But the nightmare in the Congo wasn't over. A few months later, pro-Lumumbus rebels in Stanleyville began to rape, torture, kill, and even cannibalized the European population, which included a large number of missionaries. Hundreds of foreigners, mostly Belgians and Americans, were rounded up as hostages. White mercenaries, nicknamed the Frightful Ones, raced to rescue them. In the US, President Lyndon Johnson, who had by this time succeeded the assassinated John Kennedy, authorized a joint American-Belgian rescue operation, timed to coincide with the arrival of the mercenaries. On the 24th of November, Belgian parachutists were flown in by the US Air Force, and in a spectacular operation, rescued most of the hostages. Dad came in through the jeeps from the airport, you know, with the uh, mercenaries and you know, liberating um, Stanleyville. And they went to the, the big hotel there. They went into the restaurant, which was all smashed and broken. And then they went to the, uh, to the uh, kitchen. And there it was, in the refrigerators, was all the um, calf muscles and um, uh, muscles from uh, the missionaries, all the, uh, the Europeans that stayed behind. Their cannibalism was absolutely rife. The events in the Congo and elsewhere had a very negative effect on promoting a, what I call a liberal point of view in South Africa. You know, every time a nun was murdered or something like that, and it was always the day before some local election, it had a dramatically negative effect. And then we got Mobutu with a total disaster. Well, that was the, that was the idea of the CIA, not a good idea. In October of 1965, Mobutu once again seized power in the Congo, this time permanently. 
he would remain in power for the next 34 years. Widely characterized as an American puppet, Mobutu's regime would be known for its corruption and brutality. As the Cold War came to dominate U.S. foreign policy, supporting pro-Western dictators like Mobutu seemed the best alternative when the U.S. feared that a third world country might embrace communism. Billions of dollars in U.S. aid poured into the Congo. It accomplished little but to make Mobutu one of the richest men in the world. He was the supreme kleptocrat who mismanaged the country for 30 years, but yet held it together. I suppose if anybody wins the, the ghastly events in the Congo in the early 1960s, certainly not the Congolese people, it's the United States of America and its mineral interests and it's content to sit by watching the depredations of the Kuist, Mobutu uh, Seko. By the mid-1960s, America's interest in Africa had waned. The escalating conflict in Southeast Asia had taken center stage. For Kwame Nkrumah, the man who had embodied the spirit of hope for black Africans everywhere, there was to be an undignified ending. From the 60s, my father was preaching very loudly on anti-imperialism and anti-neocolonialism. And this didn't go well, down well with the Western powers. And so one felt there was also considerable machinations from external forces to topple the government. In March 1966, while in China en route to Hanoi, Nkrumah was deposed by a military coup. You know, this was part of the Cold War. You see, unfortunately, uh, Kwame seemed to uh, rely more and more on the Eastern group as against the West. And of course, they didn't like it. The Americans, the Americans did, not, uh, did not like it. With Nkrumah deposed and Lumumba assassinated, only Sekuture was left to pursue the vision the three had shared. In the end, though, he too would be accused of despotism in the running of his country. Many Ghanaians, however, Blame this on the West. Il a lutté jusqu'au dernier souffle de sa vie, parce que tous les jours que Dieu faisait, tous les complots sont vrais. On vous dira c'est pas vrai, c'était vrai. C'était ourdi par le camp occidental globalement pris. In a final moving gesture reflecting their years of friendship, Sekouture invited Nkrumah to be co-president of Guinea. From exile in Guinea, Nkrumah watched as African independence was undermined by the politics of the Cold War. Often the result was chaos and bloodshed. Up until his death in 1972, Nkrumah insisted that the only hope in the face of all this was the unity of African nations. There was a lonely voice somewhere shouting People thought he was scaring, unnecessary, calling wolf, wolf, wolf. One can only be proud of him. <laughs> one didn't follow his footsteps, but one can only be proud of whatever message he was trying to shout at us, and most people were not listening. Thank you.
Funding for this program was provided by the Australian Film Finance Corporation. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Screen West, and the Lotteries Commission of Western Australia.